Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hello and welcome to House of Rugby. Joining me for this one, two players, two exiles in fact, who made a big impact at the weekend. Sean O'Brien back to his best and back to one of the biggest comebacks in Premiership history. And Alex Good, who after the longest pre-season ever, played his first match in the Japanese league. Um, shiny, happy people, I would imagine, after your weekend's exploits. Oh, we're in fantastic form, the two of us, I'd say. Fantastic form now. <laughs> well, you got a draw, Sean, and I, I lost, but you wouldn't know it. You'd think it was probably one. Um, but yeah, very interesting first game of top league. It turns out it's probably the league for me. Absolutely no defence. Um, a uh, 47-38 classic uh, we lost, but uh, ball being chucked around everywhere, playing in sunshine, crowds at the game. So, yeah, not a nice weekend in that sense. Just a shame we couldn't get uh, the result, but uh, we were playing the best team. I thought the Japanese were unbelievable at defending, no? Uh, not in. If you looked at the results this weekend in the top league, you would say no. Uh, there was a 75-10 okay. classic. There was a 30... 30- 34-32 game. There was, there was high scoring everywhere. So uh, it's very quick tempo and they would rather have the ball than defend, that's for sure. Oh, You're nice. a sevens player now. Yeah, yeah, it seems that way. I'm going to come back. Built Is like there a any room whip, for me probably. over there? Is there any room uh, for me Sure, over no. There? They, don't, they don't like, um, you know, mauling and grappling. And, you no, know. You, said high tempo, you said high tempo, fast rugby, ball handling skills, etc. Cart horses like yourself would have no chance. I could play 12, you play 10, lad. Yeah, that would that would go well. Uh, yeah, it mm. would go. But I think um, my experience of the, the first weekend was, it's quite different. And I, th- I think, Sean, you could probably relate to this a bit or, or not, um, in the sense that it's quite, uh, I say, Sunday league, in the sense of, it's very professional at the game, but, you know, maybe I've been a bit pampered or spoiled at Saracens, but the fact that, you know, the kit man, you arrive at the game and the kit man has your kit and probably has a spare gum shield and, you know, there's balls and there's everything sort of ready for you. So all you have to take in England um, is your boots and your gum shield pretty much. You know, you turn up in your tracksuit and off you go. Here it's, um, you know, you've got to take your match socks, your match shorts, you've got to take your gum shield boots, you've got to take any strapping, you've got to get your, your own skins you have to take... Um, and then you go to the Shinkinson, the bullet train. You have to go in your full suit and tie because uh, you're NEC pride, which is quite strange. You travel the um, day before in your full suit and everything, and then you get to the hotel, change. And when you go to the game, it's a bit of a... Anyone can wear whatever T-shirt they want as long as it's got NEC on it, and it's a bit of a mismatch. But um, we stayed at this um, wonderful hotel, really, really nice, lovely, great dinner, you know, great feed before the night before, great breakfast. And you get to sort of, I see pre-match on the schedule and it's like an hour after breakfast. And it's like five hours before kickoff. I'm thinking, that's a bit, bit odd. Um, but I go downstairs just to see what the pre-match is about. And um, it was a bit of a shock because it was what I would describe as a very English packed lunch. It was a, a white bread sandwich, um, a carton of orange juice and a banana. And I... <laughs> I remember going to my mate going, is, is this is this actually the pre-match? Um, and I uh, had to nip along and get some rice balls from the family mart beforehand. Um, but uh, it turns out they tend to have one meal before the game. Uh, and I was sort of like, yeah, I kind of need a pre-match meal. It's a bit weird for me. I only um, have, would you believe, I only have one meal before the game. Really? Yeah, because I carb, you, load, I, I carb load the day before like so much that I only have my, like in the morning time, I'll have like, depending on the kickoff, but... Mid morning bowl of bowl of uh, overnight oats or porridge. That's it. But that wasn't quite the the end of it in terms of the preparation. It's obviously very different to somewhere I've been for fourteen years. But um, the thing that made me laugh, or maybe not at the time, I was pretty angry. Was I don't know if you've seen Mike Bassett's England football manager, um, <laughs> and there's a clip in there where they go to training and Dodsy's. Uh, he goes. Uh, he goes. Where's the balls? And he goes. I don't know. And he's left the balls back in England and they have to try and get the ball off a local uh, kids and, and he can't. But um, I go out to do my warm-up to go kicking and I see like all these bands and medicine balls, but no rugby balls. And I'm like, um, what's going on here? And I asked the first coach who came and he sort of like goes on his phone and nothing happens for five minutes. Uh, and I'm sort of warmed up now. I'm ready to sort of kick balls. Um, <laughs> my mate comes out as well. And then three more coaches come and I'm like, 
guys, where are the rugby balls? And they t- <laughs> they turn up and there's still no rugby balls and they look at each other like, what's going on? And probably just like, uh, who is this annoying Englishman who wants to warm up? <laughs> um, and then by the time the whole team's come out for the team, eventually the balls arrive and I'm like, you know, fuming at this point. I've had to do air kicking, like like visually just imagining kicking the ball over, you know, going around the corner, like kicking there, you know, like I'm honestly like pretending to play football like in Mike Bassett, pe- pretending to play rugby. And I'm like, <laughs> can we please get some balls? And I, you know, eventually they turn up and have a few and, and we get on with the game. But um, it was it was a really nice experience to actually get out on the field and play rugby. Just a bit frustrating not having the balls beforehand. That was, um, you know... <laughs> Uh, I bring, your, bring, bring, your, bring your own week. balls. Bring your own balls. Yeah, yeah. This week I have to yeah, pump my own yeah. ball up at home. Just take it under my arm on the travel the day before. <laughs> With the suit um, on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was a bit different, but um, the the, like, the standard rugby was was very good in terms of the movement. Uh, the speed of the game was was awesome, and as I said, to have five thousand fans there was was fantastic. Yeah. It really felt like a proper game. Was that Cruisers team, by the way? No. So the schedule changed. Um, in December we played Kobe which is Dan mm. Carter's old team so uh, Ben Smith Brody Vitalik were playing uh, a couple of Japanese internationals so they're pretty handy safe to say um, it's good <laughs> takes game. your Sunday league up a level yeah and I say that with a little bit of respect you know it, it may sound you know I'm not trying to just yeah. the competition it was just the uh, the pre-match stuff was very different to what I've always always known so and now I know it so I can get a bit more adjusted Well, actually, Alex, talking of Dan Carter, we found out last week that at the age of 38, he'd be finally hanging up his boots. Um, For many, he is the greatest of all time. So we thought, let's get another goat into the paddock to talk about him. Uh, Brian Habana, welcome. I don't know if I say equal with him, Lee McKenzie. Um, Thank you for putting that category. (laughs) Um, Looking at Dan's stats purely from a win ratio perspective, like 82%. Compared to my 65, but um, I think a sad day for rugby. I think uh, a happy day for all of us retired people because we were actually wondering was he ever going to hang up his boots. Um, it literally seemed like he just could, could just keep on going, you know, winning trophies everywhere, you know, and every blade of grass he touched. So I think a sad day for rugby. I think you know a guy who, without a doubt, will be in almost every rugby supporter and fans, you know. 15 uh, in any day of the week. So pleasure to have played against him. Um, you know, not a pleasure to have lost so many times against him, uh, you know, playing you know, playing against the All Blacks. But, you know, the money he gave back to the game was phenomenal. So we're going to talk about him and all your memories of him in just a moment. But I imagine that you've all played against each other at some point, whether it be internationally or in Champions Cup as well. Uh, Sean, your experience against Brian? Um, yeah, we played... Um it was actually my second cap was the first time I ever um, I came across the Springboks and, and Brian um, in Crow Park in 2009 and I was absolutely shitting a brick about uh, about playing against like Backy's Boat or John Smith this fella if I if if I ended up on the wing with a one on one with him um, so it was uh, yeah it was actually a great day for us I think Johnny Sexton kicked all the points um Beating the Springboks in Crow Park as well. It was a special day, but um, it was one of those days where I was I was glad it, I wasn't out there or wasn't in a one on one situation, um, with the man we have on the show tonight. But um, a good day at the office, all the same for us. I think just to be very clear, you meant Andy Good there, yeah. not no, Alex Good. Yeah, no, no, no. He's, he's not no, strapping you up quite me. a bit, didn't you? Your hands, your fragile wrists, man. I mean, you walked around. Uh, just, 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 just one oh, thumb, okay, one sorry. thumb. Okay, I think My maybe. Bad. Apologies. <laughs> But it's good to know you really <laughs> paying attention to me. It's good video analysis. Yeah. For that. <laughs> no wonder we had no chance when we played you guys. Because um, I, I played against you, um, not not such a good memory. Uh, Millennium Stadium. Yeah, not a good memory for me. Let's move along. Not long. a good memory for me either, Goody. Let's just move along. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> Brian had the uh, the best club side I've ever played against uh, in Toulon that day. And Johnny, Matt Gitto himself, Juan Flanders Lobe, uh, Bakis Botho again, to name a few. And... Um, yeah, they beat us in the Champions Cup final pretty convincingly. But uh, yeah, Brian's never really lived down the last five minutes, unfortunately. Yeah. I'll, I'll let him tell it if you want. So moving along swiftly, talking about Toulon, um, Sean O'Brien, <laughs> like, I, I did my best convincing skills at yes, a dodgy old did. pub on a Saturday night um, in on, on the Morion like, at the beachfront. And apparently it just wasn't good enough, eh? And no. Murad and his, no. and his Euros and my negotiating skills just weren't <laughs> that good, eh? No, well, it, it nearly, it actually, the pre-contract happened. Would you believe that? No. Um, 
Yeah, that's what he was meant to fly over on a Monday or Tuesday morning on his on his plane yeah. or jet, whatever he has, mm. and he couldn't fly because of uh, weather conditions. And I refused to give me a contract that the next morning. So it not enough it gold worked. in the world for it you, eh, Shawnee? <laughs> Flying to <laughs> France and having the chat worked. <laughs> But yeah, no, actually, I was, when you look back on certain things like that, he actually won, I think, two Champions Cups the following two years, didn't he? Yeah. Um, so it would have been, it would have been a nice one to go away, win two, because uh, we didn't win anything in Leinster for a couple of years at that stage, and um, yeah. come back then and win, win the other four that we won, so that would have been six altogether, but... <laughs> Okay, stop bragging. Let's not get greedy. Yeah, I am looking people. at this screen and seeing a lot of Champions Cup winners. So there's a lot of stars on this screen, uh, literally, metaphorically. Let's talk about another one, though, in Dan Carter. Um, Brian, we actually did a programme with Dan last year. For some reason unknown to everyone, you turned up in fancy dress, which was not part of the gig. But anyway, it was... Um, McKenzie, that was... You told... You said it was going to be a dress-up. Uh, <laughs> like, Patrick sent me a... Like, what did Lee turn Nothing. up in is the question. She freaking absolutely oh, I bought me. something. She, no, well, yeah, something. Um, <laughs> in, yeah, it's not uh, that kind of like party. She, I've been to this almost, before. They never end almost well. Like you, almost like you played me in Scotland getting <laughs> killed under a bus, Lee McKenzie. Um, no, I, I got a. I literally got the invite saying it's a dress up. Um, and it was COVID and I thought, you know, let's dress up. And, and then I was apparently I the only it. one got dressed up thanks me <laughs> right well yeah. let's move on from that and we'll also tell the, the near death bus story a bit later on in the pod as well um, but Dan Carter at that point you know a year ago was wanting to play until he was 40 and then it's just been a crazy year life takes over doesn't it I think um, Tom Brady probably rubbed off a bit of Dan on that tag boat in Monaco on a few occasions <laughs> um, you know, Tom being 40, 42 and winning another Super Bowl but yeah, I just think he felt the longevity in his body. You know, he looked after himself really, really well. He hadn't really been injury prone. And, you know, chatting last year, um, you know, post the, the Rugby World Cup in Japan and, you know, seeing how well he'd, he'd actually done there, he really felt that it could go. Um, I think unfortunate that, you know, someone like Bowden Barrett ahead of him at the Blues just, you know, made it extremely difficult to try and get any Super Rugby. And then, and then COVID happened. Um, COVID and, you know, another little baby on the, on the way. So you know, that probably changed uh, his thinking as well. But yeah, I think he, he gave it everything. I don't think anyone that has ever watched the rugby, you know, while Dan is playing would ever think that, you know, he didn't give the game so much that, you know, we are all so thankful for because he, he literally changed the way, you know, fly offs play um, changed the way you look at it, not only on the field, but off it as well. He was a sponsor's dream. You know, Louis Vuitton, Mahesh on Don, Red Bull, um, Tag, you know, he, he just almost had it all. Um, it did squeaky, make a lot of us squeaky jealous, clean though. as well. Um, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I can't say I'm upset that he's stopped playing over in <laughs> Japan because he'd won the competition the, the last time he played in it. They'd won every game last year. It's, it's made it a bit, a bit fairer, that's for sure. But I remember playing against him once and I just remember getting near him in a tackle and he just smelt amazing. <laughs> it was like, a mid, you know, 60 minutes into a game and... You know, he looked incredible. He smelled mm -hmm. amazing. I was like, what's going on here? You know, like this is, you know, he still just managed to just drift through the game. You know, he scored a try already. He's just, you know, glorious human being. Um, it's but, one of the, uh, it's yeah, I mean, I just to ask you though, Brian, when you played against him in, for South Africa, did you find you had to make a different plan for him in terms of as a winger in the backfield, did, you know, his kicking game or the fact that he'd love to play those crossfield kicks as well? Was there a different plan you had Yeah, for I think him? when, you know, whenever you came up against the All Blacks and even the Crusaders, you know, there were definitely two guys who did analysis on the whole week, was was Richie and Dan. Um, and they sort of came as this complete pair that no matter how much analysis you did for them, and like, you know, Dan would literally, you know, potentially kick one ball across the wing and then he'd do like a reverse Carlos, you know, over your side. And it always just leave you wondering about, you know, what can you actually do to analyse him properly? And I think for us whether it be for the Springboks, you know, playing against the All Blacks, we knew that, you know, if we could nullify the Richie McCaw threat first, because that was always a tough one, but if we could get to Dan, um, you know, that was probably the biggest thing that, you know, we sort of collapsed their game. And I, I remember, I think, one game where the Springboks played the All Blacks in Cape Town in 2005, you know, my first Tri Nations, and um, Dan had a, a really off day, and, you know, our forwards, you know, the guys like Bucky's, Victor, John Smith, just got stuck into him all day. And it literally just, you know, revolved around Dan and nothing happened. He was dropping balls, you know, and unbeknown to, to Dan Carter. So, 
you tried to analyze it, you know, as a wing, it was extremely tough because it, you know, you could then kick left and right footers. So you actually had no understanding of, of what he could potentially do. And I think the way he put those around him into space, you know, whether it would be guys like Joe Rokothoko run, running off his wing, you know, that cross cross field kick to, to Dougie Howlett, it, it was just, yeah, it, it made it extremely difficult. Um, like I said, I think for all of us, as an opposition, we are happy to see him go uh, because he just made life so tough for us. He was, he was. I thought, I thought, any time I played him as well, and you boys might agree on this that he's so hard to get at as well, so hard to close down, so hard to get a shot on. He he was that good at being an out half, like. And no wonder. And we talk about his body and how fit he is still, like, um, you know, and how how well he smells, etc. And like <laughs> his face is, he's still like model material, really. So. He he never really got roughed up in many games, and you know you talk about if anyone's going to get you rough, rough you up a little bit, it'd be yeah. Back East and John Smith and these boys. <laughs> uh, you know they're best in the business at it, and um, yeah. you know he never he never really took like much hardship throughout his whole career. Yeah, I think one of Dan's great things he sort of let the opposition allow play to unfold for him. So like if you rushed out of line, you know you sort of fed into that, and you would have offloaded someone, or you know if you thought you were closing him down and have someone running off his wing. So he sort of almost allowed you to dictate the defense, and he's his real strength came in the fact that he was so quickly able to adapt to that was coming into his face. And like you say, you know, these deft little offloads and you know, everyone talks about Sonny Bill and, you know, the way he changed the game from offloads. You know, Dan was doing it like, from, I mean, that 2005 Lions tour, you know, he was it was unstoppable, you know, as I think he was a 22 or 23 year old. Um, so, yeah, like you say, Sean, uh, you know, how he didn't get more bruised up is, is um, unbeknown to any of us, eh? He had a nasty fend for a 10 as well. He's a left and right left yeah. and right hand fend, as I call it, a dual arm fend, <laughs> and he was he was good at both of them. Um, so I was actually I was actually watching. Um, he put up uh, yesterday. Put up um, the All Blacks uh, montage of him, of himself yeah. throughout his career, and some of, some of his handoffs and some of the stuff he done was absolutely outrageous. You wouldn't see forwards doing it like what he done earlier on in his career. Um, so I'm glad I'm glad he's finished now too, and he's not coming to the Premiership for another million million pound contract. <laughs> well, I was going to say he, he's. Um, I think he was tougher than people probably give him credit for because he was so, you know, beautiful to look at, and you know, said smelt so nice. He, um, you underestimate that he was a tough player. Like his defence was very good. You know, he could take the ball to the line. He loved taking people on and. Um, he actually simplified rugby at times. Yeah. You know, if you if you gave him space in the backfield, he would kick into it. You know, if you put men in the backfield, he'd move the ball. But his threat as a runner was his probably greatest gift as a fly half because he could take a line on it. As you said, Shawnee, his hand off, he ghost past people. You had to stay square or stay watching him in the 10 channel. And it allowed all this space for his centres and wingers. And, you know, they were pretty gifted in their own right outside him. So it, it just made him... Um, a real complete player at fly half and certainly as a, as a fullback playing against him was was a nightmare trying to cover all the space and you just couldn't do it so you just had to hope a lot of the time and brian we've obviously got um alex and sean two current players just now i'm just interested um in that decision to retire from your point of view um how long did it make you or take you sorry to, to come to that realization of when that end date was going to be <laughs> I think it's the worst decision any professional athlete has to make, Lee McKenzie. Um, you know, it's sort of taken me a year of trying to get back onto the pitch from from an injury that, you know, yeah. having a career that was never really, you know, bloodened with injuries to sort of struggle in the last year. And then, you know, literally sitting down one day, um, I'll never forget at my house in Toulon. And I was like, you know, how much longer do you try? Um, knowing that the end is there, knowing that, you know, you, your best days are definitely going to are behind you um, and there's not much going forward. And you know, I've had a sort of young family, you know, my wife was pregnant with our second, she was giving birth in like two months time. And I, I literally, uh, and I was a rugby man, talk about the muchness of the change room. I literally sat there like just crying my eyes out because I was like, it's done. And you know, I think when you do realize that, I think the, the emotion that runs over you is overwhelming. Um, and for some, you know, there's, there's not many Richie McCaws that, that end, you know, captaining his country to the second World Cup. Not many Johnny Wilkinsons, you know, getting God Save the Queen played at Stade, Stade de France, you know, top five, Toulon winning the top 14. You know, those cases are very few and, and far between. And, you know, for the greater percentage of professional athletes, it's, it's a tough decision. I think for me, injury um, and the age at which I was at, you know, sort of played a spot. You know, I would have loved to, 
you know, potentially go experience Japan for six months, but then, you know, just weighing up family, you know, knowing that we're potentially going to move back to South Africa, you know, my kids needed to get, start going into a routine of school. So yeah, it's not an easy decision and, and a tough one, you know, I think when all that you've known for the better part of, you know, 15 to 20 years is all of a sudden coming to an end. Um, yeah, it's pretty dem- dramatic when, when that realization does happen. Also being able to reflect back on my career, you know, I am extremely grateful for, you know, for what I was able to take with me in terms of memories, because a good mate said that, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, memories are, are all we have. And, you know, I'm extremely grateful for, for some incredible memories. And Brian, we're going to just, um, move on but you're coming back into the pod later on and we're going to talk about some of those memories so uh thanks so much for your honesty so far it's it's incredible so let's talk about some of the action from the weekend uh the action was fantastic but it was another weekend where we're talking about red cards five in the premiership in the whole of last season there was just over double that um Guys, we have also seen this in the Six Nations as well. So, so Sean, why is this the case, particularly at the weekend? Well, it's just, I suppose you look at the you look at the different reds that were given out. Um, it's this neck and head area, um, you know, contact. And as players now, you know, I just think we're so aware of it now. You cannot. It's it's whether it be missed timing. There's so many variables, obviously, uh, when we're trying to uh, tackle people, or as I say, when you're trying to hit someone, but you're not trying to, no one goes out to do this purposely. And this is the harsh reality of it now, is that if you get something wrong, um, a second uh, late or a little bit too high, it's, it's, you know, you're looking at four to six weeks of a ban, which is, which I think, I, I, that's, that's the bigger question I have in my head is it is it warranted like is six weeks warranted for for you know not dipping low enough just at the last second or um going into a clean out <clears throat> and not not uh chicken winging as 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 we call it and and trying to bury someone it's just it's just a uh, wrong timing or it could you might have slid up a little bit so I think the the bands that have been handed out are need to be looked at more so um but obviously we're just trying to protect players and I'm all for protecting players but it's just very unfortunate at the minute and, you know, good few red cards uh, between the Six Nations and, and Prem over the last um, <clears throat> two or three weeks. And, you know, it's it's not nice to see, but the rules are the rules and, um, you know, we're tr- we are trying to manage it as best we can, but it's it's just people get it wrong at, at times and we're all human and there's going to be errors in rugby games, fatigue, um, technique issues, etc. cetera. Um, so it is, it's... it's it's a bit of a, it's a bit of like having a grenade in your hand at the minute and pulling the pin and seeing seeing where you come out at the end of it. But definitely after watching the last few weeks and seeing some of those cards, you are so conscious of it as an individual. Then, of you know, if someone is coming to you, um, you know, you need to get your technique properly because it's you don't want to be out for five, six weeks for for just a missed timing or a, a lack of judgment. So how much is this discussed within? teams just now within your team for example as you say nobody's going out to actually do it so it does it does it need to be focused upon if it's a sort of spontaneous reaction well I think it does like we've had we had obviously a red card last week um <clears throat> one of our players and um you know and when I look back at that incident I was like Jesus like he didn't hit him with his shoulder he didn't really hit him with his arm he actually hit him with his head and it was he tried to put his head to one side of the other fella's head and it was just it was literally a freak accident really like, yes, he was going in to try and tackle him, but not like a shoulder to the head or anything like that. And he's like, he's gone for six weeks now. Um, and th- and that's the hard part of it, where it's, you know what I mean? It, there wasn't intent to hit him in the head, obviously, but he caught him with his own head um, as he was coming across him. And like, they're the, they're the tough ones. Like, what do, you, what do you say to someone like that? You go into a, a sighting um, commission that I've been in a few times in my career, and you either plead innocent or you plead guilty to uh, reckless or danger dangerous play and hopefully you get a less ban. If you go in and you play innocent and say, Well, I I've nothing to do with this, they could give you a, uh, they could give you two or three months. So I think I think the way it's governed at the minute and the way the people are, are actually analysing what happens in these games and how it's dealt with and the bans are getting, I think that's the bigger picture at the minute. Mm-hmm. Um because Someone that goes in to clean out someone, if if you're tucking or chicken winging, as we call it again, 
if you're tucking and trying to hit someone in the head, that's a different story. There's intent in that. And some of these cases that we've seen in the last few weeks, there hasn't been intent to go in and try and do damage. It's just bad timing. And that's where I think the the length of the bands and stuff has to be looked at closely. And I think just with that, I think it's a clear thing. Everyone wants the game to be safer. We've seen what's happened with people having head injuries. Um, it was obviously the case with Steve Thompson, everything like that. We have to be careful. You know, we can't have people getting whacked in the head consistently and therefore there have to be bans for that. But I think the other side of it is having so many red cards now is it changing is it changing the game is it making it more about the referees which the referees don't want the players don't want because when there is a red card it completely transforms the game and i've seen in australia they've trialed having if someone gets a red card then it's 20 minutes when you've got 14 men and then someone else can come on the field another player and like i don't know if that's right or wrong because you know, if it's a violent act where Sean decides to punch someone, should they be allowed to have a player come back on in 20 minutes? I don't know. But if it's areas of grey, which you find in rugby, like, you know, that's the problem. So you have a hard rule. Yes, any red card is 20 minutes and someone else can come on. Or you say, you know, not at all. Because ultimately, you know, when someone like, again, Sean gets over the ball and he puts his head so low to the ground, the rules aren't like they're not modified. They're not. They're, they're not coming with the age at the moment because Sean puts his head down low, and players are told, letter of the law, you must bind onto someone else to then clear him out, which is a ridiculous statement. No one waits in professional in, in the professional game or the international game to bind onto someone. There's split seconds. You have to have urgency to get there before he clamps onto the ball, and sometimes you've only got the neck or the head to aim at to move him and. You know, we've talked about how the the neck rolls or crocodile rolls, whatever they're called, people don't like. Okay, but if someone's that low, it's either hitting in the back of the head or it's a crocodile roll. You can't shift them easily, or you come in the side of the ruck, and so therefore we have to look at how we interpret this and and what we do because it's impossible now for players to not get it wrong or to if someone get, lifts their head up slightly and you go out to clear them out. It's too, it's too late and it's impossible and therefore I think we do need to look at the rules and how it's interpreted um, but obviously we do need to have safety as, as paramount. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see um, what happens over the next few weeks. We've got three internationals possibly this weekend. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the programme. But now, 26 years ago, the Kings Cross Steelers Rugby Club was formed by six friends in a North London pub. But what made it different from any other rugby club but was it was the world's first gay rugby team now to mark the 25th anniversary one of their former players decided to make a documentary about the club and this week the film premieres at the Glasgow Film Festival I'm delighted to say that the man who made the film Eamon Ashton Atkinson joins us now Eamon thanks so much for your time it's a big week G'day, yeah, it's uh, it's a really exciting week. Um, it was supposed to premiere uh, just before COVID hit last year at the London um, at BFI Flair. Mm. Um, we're all ready to get on the plane. I had my suit picked out for the premiere and then COVID happened. So I've been kind of sitting on this, desperately uh, keen for it to get out there. So really excited. And just tell us about um, the film, your involvement, how long you were with the with the rugby team as well, because it's something which is close to your heart, but also your work as well. Yeah, definitely. So I'm a uh, TV journo and a cameraman by trade. So I film my own camera work um, as a correspondent. And I was uh, we were gearing up to do this big tournament. It's like the World Cup of Gay Rugby every two years. And uh, three weeks beforehand, I got a pretty bad concussion. Um, so I thought, well, rather than just go and get drunk on the sidelines, I might as well do something useful with my time. Um, so I took my camera along and I didn't really, I'd never done anything like this before. And I didn't really know what to expect, but all this kind of amazing content started unfolding in front of the camera. And um, I picked three characters in the club to kind of follow their journey and the stories and the way they opened up and, and they were very heartfelt in the interviews. And um, I had all this wonderful material enough to kind of pull together a documentary um, but my uh, my own involvement, I, I moved to London about six years ago um, when I, it was just a spur of the moment thing. I, I had um, depression as an adult and I just needed a clean start and I just randomly one day quit my job, packed up my bags, moved to London and uh, stumbled across the club and it, it changed my life. And I met a husband through the club, um, made so many wonderful lifelong friends and, and the club just it really kind of got me on the 
on the road to recovery with my depression. So I think I, I think I think from watching the the trailer of the the film, it's absolutely class, like, and it's exciting. <laughs> like I was like giddy watching it. I was like, this is going to be this is going to be brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. And the other, the other big part of it that you can see on everyone's face is the enjoyment factor everyone's having. It looks like a serious crack. I was like, when are we going on a session? <laughs> we'll, 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 all, we'll all get yeah, together have- and get down there. It'll be, uh, it, 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 I, you must have had so much fun, um, and, um you know, making it and and um, going through the whole process of it. A hundred percent. And, you know, like in the trailer, you can see there's one of our players, Drew, who's this uh, prop, uh, big, big guy. And then like he's on the stage doing a drag performance and like jumps up into the splits. And I thought he like would have broken something doing that. But um, no. Um, yeah, look, it, 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 the thing that I found with the club is it's just this wonderful community. So like a lot of us growing up gay, uh, you know, were closeted. Um, the kids at school, in my case, figured out that I was gay before I did. And, you know, I loved rugby when I was 12. I played in a, in a sort of outside club. But at school, like, that's when the bullying was the worst. You know, when I threw a ball badly, it was because I was a poof, you know, not because I just needed to learn how to throw the ball. Um, you know, and I was in the rowing team and we won the championship. And I remember it was the first time I was invited to a party and I went along and one of the other kids sort of came up to me and said, oh, F off you F and um, all these things. And no one in my team stood up for me. And like I, uh, you know, it just day in, day out, the, the bullying I got for being gay was horrendous. And, and in this masculine sport environment, that was the worst. So I pulled away from sport. And then when I kind of discovered it later on in life, um, you know, sports is wonderful thing where you're going out, you're outside, you're exercising. It's great for your mental health. Um, You know, a sport like rugby, you're you're going going into battle with your mates. You know, it's this amazing camaraderie that you build. So to kind of rediscover that in later life, it was incredible. And and I noticed it was having the same effect for other people. So that's why I wanted to make the film. Yeah, I think um, in the trailer as well, it really comes across that sort of family spirit or togetherness of you know, all in it together as you are in rugby. And I think that was amazing. And uh, you said that when you first came over, um, you know, did you find that straight away? Did you find the Steelers straight away? Or was it a process in, in that sense? Uh, yeah, I kind of, uh, it was all by accident. I, I, I found this couple on right move that I'd moved into their spare room. And one of them was a member of the club. And I remember emailing the club and saying, hey, can I come on down? And they said, no, we're full, wait till next year. And I thought, well, stuff is, I'm just going to rock up. And I uh, just kind of snuck into a team. And um, yeah, it just, just kind of, it, it went from there. And, and, you know, I was quite overweight um this thing happens with australians we go to london and we eat all the the pub meals and drink and we put on 10 (laughs) kilos um so i was a bit heavy and uh you know i immediately started like losing the weight and and feeling much better about myself um so yeah it was it was just this incredible thing it was probably yeah the best best days of my life and one thing i think the club does really well is they have this like development squad so anyone who has never thrown a rugby ball before can just come and join and, you know, they have now 200 active players, five teams. Like, you know, I'd, I'd challenge you to find a straight team that, that you know, would have that kind of mm. huge community. So, Eamon, I'm just interested in your thoughts um, about whether sports people, not maybe just rugby as well, but there are very few active sports people when you look at, you know, Olympians, footballers, rugby yeah. players, racing drivers who actually come out as gay, particularly whilst they're competing. How much of a a pressure is there on these athletes and how much of a benefit would it be for gay rights campaigners or or just other, you know, gay people that want to take part in sport if somebody was able to do that and feel free enough to do that? Gosh, it would be massive. Like, I just remember when I was growing up, there was no one gay on TV or no gay men in sport, um, the only gay people were kind of uh, stereotypes. Uh, So, you know, to have these people come out and, you know, statistically speaking, if one in 10 people are kind of on that rainbow umbrella, um, there's got to be heaps of them out there. Um, And I can totally understand the pressures they must be facing um, career-wise and to worry if it affects sponsorship or their fan base. Um, But, you know, hopefully if I think like allyship is a really important thing. So like James Haskell came and marched with us at London Pride. Yeah. Like if you're a, an, an, a closeted player and you see that, you think, wow, like, 
you know, and, and when Israel Folau was tweeting all that uh, stuff about hell awaits homosexuals and people were piling on him saying you can't say that, like, you know, standing up for for queer people, you know, that, that plays a huge role. So, uh, yeah, what, I, I begin, like, what do you guys think? Um, because there must be players out there, you know? You know, we all know what a change room can be like. And I think it's it's making for people feel as comfortable as possible, really. Whatever um, walk of life you come from, you know, I think it, it's really important that people feel comfortable to, to be themselves, express themselves. And if they are gay, to feel comfortable enough to say it and come out. And I'm, I am, you know, convinced that a rugby environment would, as you found with the Steelers, would, you know, be so supportive and, you know, treat them, treat them completely as, as one of the team. It would no, be no remarks or difficulties. You know, they'd be completely mm-hmm. involved. And I'm sure, Sean, you say the same thing. So I think... Um, it's making someone feel completely comfortable, though, to do that um, and not have to suppress how they feel, which is which is a horrible feeling, I imagine. Um, yeah. and, and we don't want that. You know, you want people to feel comfortable. And, and ultimately, um, you know, I hope, you know, if there is someone out there who who, who is gay playing rugby, they, they feel they can feel comfortable mm. in their team, their environment, the coaching, everything, that nothing will change. It will just be mm. them playing rugby. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd agree completely with that as well. That's what I was going to say. I'd hope that... If there was someone in the environment um, that, they, that they could be open with us and 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 you know tell us anything really, you know we are we're we're, we're a bunch of brothers at the end of the day, um, you know and that's what we're that's what we're there for to help each other out to back each other up no matter what the situation is and um, you know I think I think environments rugby environments especially are 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 very good that way as well um, when someone does have a problem obviously or an issue or wants to speak to someone as it's you know it, it it is there but um yeah I, I i often wonder when we are in those like when we 55 or 60 lads in the in a in a squad like um are people comfortable There's enough be one or two. yeah, if, yeah. Is, is there go, is there one or two and if there is hopefully they come and you know even come to some of the leaders or whoever it may be management mm. and say you know this is who i am and you know we'd obviously support them in any way we can um but and yeah, you'd, you'd always wonder: is it is it a bit of a thing that they just they don't really want to say it, or you know, are they afraid to say it? There's there's so many variables to it. And and you know, like I, I think it's just a slow journey because um, you know we wouldn't be having this conversation 15, 20 years ago. And like uh, the CEO and COO of England Rugby watched my film and they sent it to the board and they tweeted about it and they're watching it internally among all their staff this week and, and they're just getting right behind it. And the All Blacks tweeted the trailer and it got half a million views. So like, you know, if you were to tell me as a young kid getting bullied in the, you know, sporting pitch that that would happen, I wouldn't believe you. So, you know, that visibility and, and having people talk about it like this, um, you know, is is so important. I, I just think, Amos, unbelievable what you're doing, to be fair. And like, it's it's brilliant. And it is like, I had a, I had a smile on my face earlier watching the trailer. <laughs> and, so. you know, I just think it's a credit to everyone involved. So well done on everything you've done. Just uh, echo that. I think it's an amazing story you're telling and, and putting it out there. But I think as well, the even deeper sense of, you said that you were in a bad place um, when you came over. And I think the fact that it's helped you so much... Yeah mentally I think is so important you know we talk about being kind but you found something you could really get behind it helped you you know in terms of exercise feeling good mental well-being and that um for me um in light of everything that's going on with covid and um so many people struggling and and depression and people who are not able to come out and express themselves as we've talked about i think is is so important and it's amazing that helps you and there's probably hundreds and thousands of people it can help and that that's uh, you know an amazing thing that rugby's done but also the community and I just hope people, when the pandemic kind of eases and I know they can start playing outdoor sports soon, that people just go there and put themselves out there. And even though they might be a bit nervous to rock up to a club, you know, it can be quite nerve wracking going down to that first training session. But just go and give it a go because it changed my life. And, you know, I met a husband through it. So, uh, you know, you never know what's what's around the corner for you. Eamon, thank you so much for your time. It has been a a real breath of fresh air. Um, It's been a pleasure to have you on and all the best with the film because as the the guys have said, it's, it's, you know, it's a a classy piece of um, of sort of film directing and producing from your point of view and from the heart as well, which is why it 
It is so good. Thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Guys, great to hear from Eamon there. And it's it's really inspirational what he's doing, isn't it? And trying to help get this message out. Yeah, I think that it's an amazing story um, for someone to come over and be at such a low ebb and then to find such a wonderful community uh, in rugby and, and really find himself and, and feel able to express himself is phenomenal. And, and now to do a film which will hopefully mm. help so many other people is just uh, unbelievable. So yeah, I'll take my hat off to him. Yeah, absolutely. OK, we're going to get Brian Habana back on in just a moment. But before that, there are meant to be three Six Nations matches this weekend, but there are now major concerns after at least 13 of the French squad, including coaches, uh, contracted COVID. There is now a doubt whether the Scotland match will happen this weekend, although by the time you listen to this or watch this, that will have been resolved or might have been resolved. Um, but it's getting messy, guys, isn't it? Because if they use the fallow week, then it means that Scotland, you know, they have to release their players back to clubs, which means that Scotland then lose at least 10 of their players, including Finn Russell, Stuart Hawke, Johnny Gray. So... One of these teams is going to be, um, you know, compromised no matter which weekend it is. Yeah, I think, <coughs> I think it'll go ahead though. I think it'll go ahead this weekend. Um, sure, it's only thirteen of the French. They've they've enough to play three teams at the minute. Right. They're all they're all. And they did really, in the Autumn really Nations good. Cup. Exactly. So they're really good players. So I can't see how it won't go ahead. To be fair, and Scotland won't want won't want uh, you know the second option. Obviously, no. Um, they'll want to get a bit of momentum now and. Um, try and get back on winning ways but um yeah i can't i can't see it not going ahead and uh you know but it is it is that's the environment we're in now so these games happen um it's the same with us in our club competitions um you're fretting on a monday morning um hoping that no one has has got covid from the game because close contacts and trace and all this stuff and then you know you could be you could be sitting on your arse for the week at home but um you know it is it's the environment we're in now as 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 uh, rugby players and um you know it's just unfortunate yeah i don't think we can have this debate with lee bear in mind she's completely biased being scottish um, <laughs> correct actually so of course she correct. wants anton de Bont not to play um but uh look I, I think it's it's a really difficult one if you don't play it then it means you know there's a precedent set where you know what if um, England have two players who can't can't play through COVID and one's Owen Farrell and one's uh, Billy Vinopola. You know then you know they're going to not want to play the game as well. So I, I think the game has to go ahead um, uh, because of the reasons that have been stated already. Um, but it, it's such a shame not to see the best players play. Um, it's such a shame for France, obviously, who are going well the changing room shots were interesting after the Ireland match weren't they I mean broadcasters weren't allowed to put cameras in the changing rooms during Six Nations and then French rugby put their own footage out of the players and coaches going crazy celebrating it was an interesting one absolutely madness but that's typical French for you I think you know they do these mad things like like don't of all things like don't release anything from the changing room um, especially after a historic win like they had, so like keep it in house if you're going to do anything like that. But again, it's breaking it's breaking the rules. So first and foremost, they shouldn't have done it. And secondly, you know if they if they, if they did do it, don't show the whole world it. Um, Be stealth, you know, like. because it's a bit. Of, I suppose it's a bit of history for them in their archives in yeah. years to come, and and for players and and management and stuff to look back on. So I get it. I get that side of it too. But. Um, Typical French daughter, they, they could do anything at any stage. So let's bring Brian Habana back in. We were just talking, Brian, about not really knowing uh, how many Six Nations fixtures we're going to have this weekend. So I'm not really sure how we can plan where a Lions tour is going to be. Um, but with the announcement we had in the UK yesterday, it sounds like fans could be back in stadiums at this stage and maybe it'll pain you to say it. Do you think uh, a Lions tour in the UK would be the best option? Can one then actually call it a Lions tour if it is in the UK? Um, this is my point. This is my point. I've said I, it. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know if it'll be, I can't, for me as, as a player and as someone who absolutely loves what the Lions is all about, you know, having experience in 2009 and, you know, I think a lot of people talk about the games and talk about, you know, the intensity, uh, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is from a tour perspective, 
how much the Lions actually give back to the country they're visiting. Um, you know, I you know, did some stuff in, in 2009 with the guys like Jason Robinson and HSBC. And, you know, I know the Lions went into some of the townships in South Africa and, and built rugby fields and, you know, donated clothes. And, you know, they go to all these different cities, you know, in, in the countries they're visiting. Um, so I don't know if it would, for me, constitute a tour if it was to be held in the UK, Lee. Um, I think it would be absolutely sad. I think we all understand, you know, the the ferocity of this pandemic and, and what it has caused. And, you know, sport has been absolutely obliterated over the course of the last, you know, the last 13 months. And I think it will be sad. I think it's it's a massive decision to make. Um, I think the one beauty potentially about the event, because I'm not going to call it a tour happening in the UK, is that it would be summertime. Uh, but looking back at 2009, we had some, some pretty amazing weather on, on all three test matches, which... Yeah, I just know, again, from a tour perspective, uh, I think there's very few things like a Lions tour uh, you know, for South Africa and South African fans not to experience that for, for 24 years would be extremely disappointing and sad. So, yeah, for me, it probably wouldn't count as a tour if it happened in the UK. But I think for players, you know, just for it to happen, you know, that's probably, you know, if it is the best option, then I think the players would definitely you know, be in for that. And Brian, you talk so fondly about when you played against the Lions. What would be your standout memory of your career? Jeez, Whoa, that's, 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 that's a um, yeah, so tough there's, one. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. No, not the dive uh, in Millennium Stadium, Giddy. Um, <laughs> I, I actually do get asked that question a lot. And I think I tell everyone that, you know, when I when I made my test debut back in 2004, you know, as you know, having got inspired to take up the game of rugby, you know, by that iconic moment in 95 when South Africa... You know, got to witness you know one of the best sporting you know moments ever to to have been experienced you know as a 12 year old boy to see a team unite the country and get inspired to pick up the game to then you know fast forward you know nine years get the opportunity to represent my country you know score a try against the then world champions England at the home of rugby Twickenham with my first touch of the ball in international rugby um you know it's just sort of laid a foundation where I just I never wanted to, to relinquish you know, that opportunity. It made me desire to be in there for as long as possible and not just be a, a flash in the pan, uh, you know, one year wonder, uh, but literally, you know, try to become, you know, one of the best that, that ever donned a Springbok jersey and, and leave it in a better place. So I think for me, you know, through all the highs of winning trophies of, you know, all the enjoyment in, in the change rooms, you know, going through the tough times, you know, getting to represent my country for the first time, getting to be bestowed with that honor of knowing, you know, what that privilege is all about, and then understanding that I never want to let it go and I'll hold on to it as long as possible uh, was a moment that, you know, probably just set the foundation for where I wanted to go because I didn't just like want to be around for a year. You know, I wanted to do, you know, 50 test matches, potentially become you know, the first player of Cullen South Africa to play 100 test matches. So, yeah, that, that first game, and I think you know, we could, it could only been better if we'd actually beaten England that day. We actually got thumped. I think we got like 32-16 was the final score. It was extremely cold. I even almost ran onto the field with my beanie on um, with eight minutes left. It, it was that cold. Um, but yeah, that, that was pretty special. And which players just now, Brian, that you're watching um, excite you? I mean, I know you know Cheslin Colby pretty well and there's the obvious comparisons and things, but who out there at the moment is sort of making your heart beat a bit quicker? Apart from me and Shawnee, obviously. Obviously. That goes without yeah, saying. Yeah, they're, 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 they're not streaming. His heart the, the is going top. slower when he's watching us. <laughs> 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 no, the Cheslin's, Cheslin's definitely up there at the moment. I think, you know, seeing how he burst onto the scene, sort of 2017 and 18, um, he's been lighting up the fields. Uh, Semi Radrada, you know, I got to witness him, you know, firsthand at Toulon, and he is just incredible I mean I think he's, what he's able to do on, on a field is, is ridiculous um, someone like Anton Dupont at the moment uh, is is playing phenomenal rugby I, I don't think there are better players in, in the world at the moment than him um, and I think he's, uh, he's he's going going really really well um, you know Johnny May and, and his acrobatics last weekend were, were pretty special and he's a guy you know I think he's, his work ethic has been been phenomenal you know I think there's a lot of I almost want to say a bit of envy from my side, you know, seeing how he just continues going. And, you know, he's, he's on, I want to say he's on the other side of 30 now, but, you know, he's, um, you know, he's not a youngster anymore, but he's, he's been going really well. So I think for me, it would probably be, you know, between Anton, uh, Semi and, and Cheslin as, as the top three, you know, exciting players in, in world rugby at the moment. One thing that I, th working with you at Channel 4, one thing I think is really nice as well, it doesn't matter if we are at the rec. Um, if we've gone to Tommen Park, wherever, you're always met with uh, 
such a, a great sort of reception, whether it be from a dad pushing his tiny young kid in to get a photo with you, which happens quite a lot, um, or anyone. They, they're just so pleased to see you at these grounds. And that must be, be really special because that kind of flips back to the Dan thing about giving back to the sport. You know, everyone's mm. really happy to see you there. They're not, it's not that they're unhappy when Jamie Heaslip turns up at Tomond Park, but they're very happy to see you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure that it'll be the same at, at Allianz. Um, or well, it's not even called Allianz. What's it called now, Giddy? Uh, Stone X Stadium. It's, it rings, it rings, yeah, it comes Stadium. off the tongue quick, that one. Yeah, so, so great. But I think, Lee, you know, the beauty about being able to be given a platform um, you know, as a professional athlete, and you know, I, I think for all of us, you know, we all sat there at one point as, as a youngster, you know, looking up at our heroes and, and wanting to aspire to be like them. And I think the beauty particularly in a country like South Africa, where sport has played such an integral role in bringing people together and, and uniting people you know, to, to have sort of experience it on both sides of the coin. You know, it just makes you value the opportunity and, and platform you're given. And again, you know, doing, you know, doing a photograph or you know, signing an autograph uh, is, is the least we can do because you never know if you're actually you know, passing that on. And I actually tell people a funny story. In 95, I had no clue about rugby and my dad took us to watched the Springboks last ever training before the, oh, the their last camp uh, before they went into the you know, into the World Cup squad camp and you know after the training like I was just amazed by all these you know incredible massive players you know Corbus Visa and Francois Pinas of the world and afterwards we were like all standing there waiting to get autographs and Francois Pinot came out and sort of selected three of us it was still very amateur and they all had to drive in their own cars back to the hotel um, and he sort of called three of us to help him with his bags and you know, I was sort of one of the three kids he'd selected. And then when we got to his car, he gave us each a piece of memorabilia. You know, and I got one of his rugby jerseys that I literally slept in, trained in, you know, did everything in for like five years. Because it was just, and you know, it was very symbolic. And I actually got to share that story with Francois, um, you know, two years ago at, at the launch of my foundation here in South Africa. And it actually, you know, you actually never know what you're passing on yeah. in terms of a legacy. And, you know, that for me... When you do get the opportunity to sign or you know be friendly with people, um, I think it's the least we can do because, again, like I said earlier, when you get to do something you love, you know you get paid extremely well to do it. Um, you know we're not always perfect, so we don't always get it right. But yeah, you know as as much as we can, we you know we try to play play our part in hopefully inspiring you know the next generation. Did Francois remember it? No, nope, not at all. <laughs> Uh, he's like, oh, like, uh, like, <laughs> like, oh, and like uh, that happens with a lot of us. Now. You, like, you have these things that yeah, come pretty, pretty close to you. But yeah, no, he had absolutely zero recollection of it. So I don't want to say I was heartbroken, um, but maybe the story doesn't go down as well anymore. Um, we talked about your trips to Munster, and I know you mentioned it earlier on. Just get it off your chest about the near-death experience in Edinburgh, because... I'll try and edit it out afterwards in this program, but I know you want to you want to stitch me yeah. up on this. No, well, I don't want to stitch you up. I just think you know I'm a guy who literally wears my heart to my sleeve, so go out of my <laughs> way to make people around me happy. You, you know, you, I think I think actually had to go get dressed up like with four layers on. Was that cold in Edinburgh to go find food because you were hungry, um, and then you literally almost got me ridden over by a bus. Like you sold me the biggest dummy. Like I literally, you know, thanks Lee McKenzie. Um, I thought we were close, uh, but apparently we were like this, eh? like Lee, Brian, Lee, Brian. So what it's happened not, was... It's I not looked... the first time, Brian, that she she throws yeah. the ties out of Pram. The, there's been a couple of shows that we've had here that have been have been tricky. This is getting yeah, edited it's out. Fa- it's very, this is edited very out. tricky What happened the show. was, bus was coming. Well, I'll explain it from my side. The bus was coming. I apparently looked at Brian. I looked at him, stepped out, and then changed my mind, so I didn't want to get run over, so I stepped back. He hadn't taken the signal. He you walked right him. out. <laughs> I dummied you him. Would, <laughs> yeah, like dummied him and pushed like, him, eh? Classic. To, to yeah. the, 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 the handoff was a bit much. But then when yeah. he stood back onto the central reservation, he just started shouting at me, who do you think you are, Finn Russell? Which was just even more bizarre, because apparently I'd looked him in the eye, dummied him, and off he went, and the yeah. bus had to do yeah. a proper Thanks. emergency stop. Yeah. That's how it fully was. Engaged, Everyone's... No, I, was just, I was also fully engaged in the conversation, Lee McKenzie. I was like, just trying to... You know, and we're all yeah, here thanks. to tell the story, so we're fine. Thank, thank well, God. Just, yeah, thank just, God. Yeah, I was about to say, it could have been, you, could have been a lot worse. Yeah. It and sounds irresponsible for that. It does sound a bit like, Lee, you know, you're, you're in Scotland and you think all the fans are going to be seeing you and stuff and they've gone up to Brian, asked for a photo, they're chatting to him and you're just a bit disappointed about it and thought, you know what? 
he's, he's a nice guy. He's got a lovely smile. Let's just push him in the road, okay? I want a bit more but this attention. But this is my manner. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's it. You well, not I think, that Lee McKenzie, never I think on uh, on that happy note, it's time to end this programme. Brian, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Alex and Sean, thank you for your company and we'll be back next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching The House of Rugby Season 3 on Joe.